Okay, so here we go. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one, two, one. 2317. Animals have become sentient and rule the earth. The United States of Animals is a safe and protected place in a world otherwise overrun with violence and war. Queen and enemy, the beloved leader, has been kidnapped by unknown forces. Your mission is to find clues to rescue her. Certain animals have puzzles for you to solve to gain information leading to her location. Do not fail us. You must save Queen Anemone soon. Before a deadline of the full moon. Her captors have left us clues. Which we believe to not be a ruse. Five animals you must consult. If you expect to get a favorable result. Each will give you a puzzle or test. Solve them all to complete your quest. Now go forth on the forest way. Delay not, for your success we pray. You will encounter the first clue giver. I have heard it may give you a shiver. I will accept the mission my king. I will find Queen Anemone and rescue her. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> so, I have no idea how to make that. I'm not going to teach you how to make that. What I am going to do is give you some examples of where we have um, elevated the uh, adventure labs and hopefully inspire you give you some thoughts because a lot of you will have adventure lab credits that you don't know how to use so here we go as we go to leveling up your adventure lab let me give you a little overview of what we're going to do in 45 minutes first thing we're going to do is talk very briefly about what is an adventure lab Going to talk about my experiences with Adventure Labs. Do a little comparison of the history and the trends of geocaches and compare them to the history and trends of Adventure Labs. If you decide to level up your Adventure Lab, you're going to meet some challenges. Going to meet some challenges and probably the most important one is that geocachers look at Adventure Labs as five easy finds. Going to look at two adventure labs that I created. Going to call them self guided tours, just your basic adventure labs. But I have elevated them up and to do something a little bit different. Then we're going to look at two people who have taken an adventure lab, wrapped it around the story of intrigue and mystery and a lot of humor. And finally, we're going to look at two, what I call self contained adventure labs. Adventure Labs that take you someplace, but aren't going to ask you any questions about the place you've gone. If any of you have happened to do the one that was set up last night around here, connection to this, uh, to this presentation, that's an example of a, um, of a self-contained Adventure Lab. If we have time, we'll go ahead and have a little time to ask some questions, do a little sharing, share some of the Adventure Labs that you might have done that you consider you know, elevated. All right, what's an adventure lab? So briefly, an adventure lab is an extension from geocaching.com that gives you a different experience, actually has an experience more uh, like an earth cache or a mystery cache or a, or a puzzle cache. When you look at them side by side, they're actually more different than they are similar. For example, we both know that they're both location-based, but with a geocache, and you guys know this, a geocache, you, a container is set, you go find it, you sign the log, you log it online, the geocacher receives an email. None of that happens with an adventure lab. On the other hand, adventure labs are frequently uh, themed around some history and take you to interesting places and Anybody can set as many geocaches as they want within 100 miles of their home. The adventure labs are doled out slowly. Most people have less than seven, five locations, so have set maybe 35 adventure lab locations. 
Some people call them a different game, same sport cheat. And I really can't disagree with that. What's my experience with Adventure Labs? Well, I found a few. I've said I found a few. Um, I don't think these are unusual numbers. What I do think is unusual, which makes me a little unique, is that because I have access to three different premium accounts and have been involved in several different locations or different projects, including a project to set up a 10 station geo or adventure lab here at uh, Cache in the Bay, I have uh, set out 25 adventure labs, 180 locations. How did I get to do this? How did I get started? Uh, why am I standing up here with confidence to teach you guys or present to you guys how to uh, elevate your adventure labs, how to level up your adventure labs? Well, I have set some, and then I got an opportunity to set one on the Lincoln Highway Adventure Lab project. That's a adventure lab where a whole bunch of people got together, linked their adventure labs to a that go all the way from New York to San Francisco. The Lincoln Highway was the first mapped out highway in the United States. As I was driving home, I got to send an adventure lab 450 miles from home, <laughs> had a 350 mile drive home after creating that and doing some on the way home. And I thought, geez, somebody should do this on, on Route 66. Somebody should do this on Route 66. <laughs> Somebody should do this on Route 66. And so when I got home, I immediately contacted GCHQ and I said, hey, has anybody contacted you about doing this on Route 66? Are you interested asking for a friend? And Gear Guru said, tell your friend, nobody has contacted us. And yes, we would be interested in doing that. And so I got to curate the Route 66 Adventure Lab series. There, Route 66 goes through eight states, so I contacted eight different uh, state coordinators, and their job was to divide the state up into sections, recruit geocachers, and get this done. In six months, we got um, 84 geocachers that created 94 adventure, lab, adventure labs for 852 locations, all the way from Chicago to Santa Monica. Down to I had so much fun doing that. I thought somebody should do that on California Highway 1. <laughs> and so I did. But part of the challenge of that, and I knew it going in, was Big Sur Highway, the best part of California Highway 1. It's 65 miles, absolutely no internet connection. So I had to figure out how can we do this. So I spent about three months running around practicing, trying different things, and finally realized we can do this. And I created this document uh, that you have in your hand that show, tells you how to do an adventure lab when you don't have internet connection. It's also available at this bit.ly site, which is also on your handout. I was also working with uh, Lisa at Cache, Cache Advance, and I was making training videos for her every other week, which she was, which we were, uh, distributing on a subscription basis. And when I got done, I made a video, an eight and a half minute video, where I actually showed and went through how to do this. And when I got done making that video, I said to Lisa, you know, this is too important. We have to get this to everybody. Can I have permission to do that? And she gave me permission to do that. And it's also available on a bit.ly link, which is also on your handout. As I'm preparing this, I keep looking back at kind of the history of geocaching and comparing it to the history, the short history of Adventure Labs. They're always changing. We're always at a crossroads. <laughs> you know, geocachers are very creative and they give them something, they will figure out something to do with it. Well, we started out uh, with hikes going to interesting places. So they were the first geocaches out there. And then they came into smalls and micros, came into the urban area, and now we're looking at guardrails, LPCs, um, bushes, and so forth. And then some people started creating clever hides. Things are hidden in plain sight, 
And on the, and on the other end of the spectrum, people are creating power trails. Well, the, the clever caches turned into gadget caches, the power trails have turned into geoarch. The history of Adventure Labs is much shorter, but actually much more dynamic because when they came into existence, there were 3, 000, 3 million geocaches out there and hundreds of thousands of geocachers. So kind of bypassed the hiking phase and went right to the uh, interesting places because by their very nature, uh, Adventure Labs are taking to interesting places. So Ronald Reagan came up with that term, the magical history tour, to describe kind of your basic adventure lab. You know, you go someplace, you learn something, read a plaque or whatever, answer a question, move on. Uh, recently, I heard Land Monkey call them a, uh, a self-guided tour, which I really kind of prefer, so that's the term that I'm going to use. Self-guided tours turned into historic uh, highway AL series with the Lincoln Highway Route 66, uh, there are now dozens around the world of historic highway series. But they basically are, you know, just self-guided tours. You just drive them instead of walk them. Recently, there's been a trend in Adventure Labs where people are taking their Adventure Labs, linking them together, and creating geo art. Here in Tennessee, 29 geocachers got together created a, a geo-art, which you do entirely sitting in a rest stop off the highway. There's 145 locations, and one uh, geocacher recently said that was an hour well spent. <laughs> now, not putting it down, because he traveled a far away, got a lot of joy out of what he did, and, uh, you know, and that's what geocache is. Grab the things that give you joy, and do them. But it did make me wonder, if we're going to GeoArt, where are the clever, the equivalent of the clever hides, the clever geocaches, the equivalent of the gadget geocaches? Now that's where we're going to go here. Going to have a challenge, to put out a challenge to take and level up your adventure lab. Maybe it'll be something simple, like making the description a little bit better kind of the equivalent of putting out a preform instead of a pill bottle. Or maybe you'll get an idea of how to take something much higher, the equivalent of a clever geocache or even a gadget cache. But as you do realize there's going to be some challenges because geocachers have developed certain patterns as they geocache. For example, many people don't read the descriptions. They've also come to an, <laughs> they've also uh, created an expectation of what an adventure lab should be. Okay, by a show of hands, geocaching.com comes out with a, with a challenge, a uh, souvenir challenge, one of their promotions, and it's based on fines, on getting smileys. How many think, ooh, that would be okay, all I need to do is find a few adventure labs. All right, well, not as big as I thought. And that's because many people look at adventure labs as five quick finds. What strikes me as funny, strikes me as funny that somebody who's willing to look for 20 minutes for a bison in a pine tree gets upset when we don't tell them that the answer is T-H-R-E-E -E instead of three. <laughs> Okay, here's another question. Raise your hand and keep it up if you're a geocacher. Raise your hand, keep it up if you're a geocacher. You're going for a traditional geocache. Leave your hand up if the first thing you do is read the description. Not the hint, read the description. <laughs> oh, then there goes a lot of hands. <laughs> and that's kind of where acknowledging a lot of us don't look at the, don't read the description until we can't find the geocache. Okay, put your hands down. Uh, this time, you're going for a multi, a virtual, a challenge, or an earth cache. Raise your hand if the first thing you do is read the description. Yeah. Okay, so 
a lot of people are talking the fact that uh, adventure labs really are more like a non-traditional. So one of the things that you have to do and we have to convince people to do is read the description first. And I'm going to take, give you a couple of hints on how to help people read the description. Okay, you're going to do another hand raise and exercise. So loosen up your shoulders. Okay, I'm going to show you a write-up of an earth cache. Don't try and read it, it's going to scroll up pretty quickly. But just imagine that you're out in the field and you're reading this, and raise your hand when you would go, blah, 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 <laughs> what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about where I get to. <laughs> Our local people can probably guess who's the bench, who uh, Earth Cash this is. <laughs> All right. Here's one scene that I remember really uh, very vividly from the river runs through it. And this is really the best advice I can give when writing up a description or a location for an adventure lab. So it was with my formal education as well. Each weekday while my father worked on his Sunday sermon, I attended the school of the Reverend McLean. He taught nothing but reading and writing, and being a Scot, believed that the art of writing lay in thrift. Half as long. Half as long. I guess being a Scot, I believe that the art of writing does lie in thrift. Um, so, Make your, you know, make your descriptions as short as possible. Um, those of you who lament, hey, they're only allowing me 1,024 characters in my description. Remember back when you're in junior high school or high school and the dread you had when the teacher said, I want you to write a 200 word essay on well, 1,024 is 2,005, 205 words. And I kind of think it would be interesting if they uh, put that on the same, that same limitation on earth caches. <laughs> okay. Second suggestion is do some research. You know, anybody can go to a location, write down, take a picture of the plaque, write it up in a description, pick a word or a date off of the plaque, and call it a location. Let's do better. Let's give them some information that they can't get on scene. Here's an example. I'm creating an adventure lab on uh, the California Highway 1 series. I scoped out the area, found that there was an old uh, train depot, and so naturally that's going to be one of my locations. There, they had a house of one of the Dunites. I'm like, what the heck's a Dunite? So I started doing some research. Dunites were vagabonds and philosophers, nature lovers, and artists, and they would get together on a regular basis around the campfire and share philosophies and ideas and thoughts. And it was here that an unknown author, John Steinbeck, first read Totia Flats to the group. Kind of interesting. Here's some information that you can add to your description to make it more interesting and more in informative. Put in a DT rating. Is this walking? Is it driving? How far is it? If you're putting out a bonus, make sure that you put the GC code of the bonus lap bonus in there or a link if that's possible. Of course, you're going to introduce the people to the subject and you're going to offer some other information. And part of that information could be stop and read. And part of the problem is actually built right into the uh, into the app. Part of the problem is this is the screen that comes up where there's the description. And if somebody hits start, they bypass the whole thing if they don't go ahead and scroll through. 
So you've done some, you've done a lot of research. You've written a concise description. You want people to read it. Here's one way to do that. Require two answers for every location. One of those answers is going to come out of the description, and the other answer is going to come out of the location. <clears throat> for example, here at the Bob Hope Airport, we t in the description I tell people there's Bob Hope was 100 years old when he died. Down here, to reward people who read the description, I tell them at the location the answer you need is in the wall hanging. And I don't mention that in the question. So somebody who didn't read through is looking around trying to figure out where is that emblem. Here's the challenge. It can backfire on you. That happened in C at the Seabeck Drive up here in uh, Seattle. She did use this technique, and, uh, and despite the fact that she told people stop and read to avoid frustration, some people didn't. This person was able to figure it out after one location and got the other nine. This person never figured it out. So she spent over half an hour researching the question, had to go to the internet twice, and didn't like the Adventure Lab. She didn't have to do that. All she needed to do was RTFD. <laughs> and we're going to talk about enhancing uh, self-guided adventure labs, just to make them a better experience. OK, here's the first one that I set up in Ojai. And partially by design and partially by luck, I wound up enhancing it uh, to a pretty good adventure lab. And yes, you do need have to stop and read. Because one of the things that I did is I wanted to make it spoof proof. What is spoofing? GCHQ set up adventure labs so that they're using uh, geofencing technology to make sure that people come to the location. But there are plenty of spoof programs out there that will spoof your phone to a different location. And if people can get within your geofencing on your phone, look up the answers on the internet, they can get credit for the, uh, for the adventure lab. That happened to me, or not happened to me, happened to a friend of mine, uh, Neil Moore. He was one of the early recipients to beta test the adventure labs. The day he made it public, 64 geocachers from Germany found the location. So that's, you know, that's why often you'll see, you know, the answers was a sign on a post or something written on a sewer grate or something along those lines. I think I had a better idea. What I did is I created a, a traditional geocache called uh, the Ohio AL starts here. And it's just a traditional geocache. Everybody can get there. They can open it up, uh, sign the log, and be done, and not have to do an adventure lab at all. But what I did is I took a pin, and I glued it on the inside. And there's words and numbers on that pin. And you have to type in the words and numbers on every answer to get credit for the answer. Again, if you did the one out here uh, that's set up you'll see that it has a code word, and that code word is for the, exactly the same reason. Okay, this adventure lab will take you to five interesting locations. That's pretty standard. But some of the fun of this is it really took people to locations that they otherwise never would have had any idea coming to Ojai. Took them to the old Ojai Jail, which is a 15 by 23 foot cinder block structure that had four cells, eight bunks in it, and it was actually in use until 1975 when the state came and said, uh, no, that's not meeting any more standards. We went to a hotel that, it takes you to a hotel that consists of 10 Airstream trailers and a tiny house set up in a campground uh, setting. And we went to the old Nordoff Cemetery, which has uh, grave sites going all the way back to the Civil War. But here's where I got lucky. <laughs> I got lucky because 
there were five pre-existing highly favored geocaches at each one of those locations. And I made sure that I referred to that in the journal so that people knew they were there and could get them when they were there. Um, which leads me to a question, or not a question, a suggestion. Wouldn't it be interesting to make an AL that would take you to five favorited geocaches, or five gadget caches, or five earth caches? Because the guidelines say we can't place a container in conjunction with the adventure lab, but nothing saying that they can't take you to interesting places, including geocaching. And Bellagio was uh, walking Ohio and came for you to something that I enjoy making videos and in incorporated into an adventure lab. It's sequential. It's sequential mainly because I wanted it to be an efficient path because you're going to be following a video. And if you didn't, if I didn't make it sequential, you'd be backtracking all the time. The answers are not at the location. They're not where you break the geofencing. So you're going to break the geofencing. You're going to get the answer to pop up, but the answer is not around you. What you must do is follow, um, is follow the video. So here we are. We're going to look for mushrooms. We've entered the geofencing, but the mushrooms are not here. We need to follow the video. So we're going to move up the walkway, go up the stairs. We're going to turn left, walk past an electrical box that's all decorated up, walk past the sign. And now we're standing where the mushrooms are. So a little bit different, a little bit unique, a little bit leveled up. Okay, another way to level up. Is to wrap your story into, a, wrap your adventure lab into a story. Here in, uh, they will come from outer space, DMF sounds. Sets, creates a story wrapped around a future uh, invasion of aliens. And he takes you to some interesting places along Colorado Boulevard, but he's not talking about what they are now. He's talking about, in a very humorous way, what they will be in the future. Uh, and the whole purpose of the AL is to give you a leg up, one which might just possibly save mankind. Oh, and the women too. Well, most of them. The ones who can run fast. It's so well done that when I got home, I read the whole story to my wife, my, my muggle wife, and she absolutely loved it. Here, uh, in the case of This Fingered Killer by Sherever64, you begin your adventure at the senior youth baseball fields, where the newspaper reporter, the investigative newspaper reporter, Anita Lead, uh, has been found murdered. And she was investigating who was embezzling funds from the baseball league. Her outstretched hand over the steering wheel and the position of her finger pointing to the thing. <laughs> pointing to a cross on top of the hill, a palm tree, and a billboard for Bottle Village seems to indicate she's trying to help you know who the killer is. And sure enough, there are three, three suspects, Deb, Deb L. Cross, Itchy Palms, and Ivana Bottle. And we're going to follow the fire investigator as he interviews the three subjects, and the journals contain evidence. Here it is. Here's the coroner's report. So once you've done all five, you should have all the information that you need to, do, to, to uh, establish two things. What piece of evidence gave was the clue was the key to solving the murder and who was the murderer. Now she also included in there, if necessary, you can use the clone holding evaluation analysis tool, also known as the cheat. 
because, and I think she did that for me actually, <laughs> because she wants you to find the geocache, but she wants you to work for it. All right, self-contained uh, adventure labs. These are adventure labs again, where you're gonna go to a location because they do have to be, you have to break some geofencing, but they have nothing to do with locations. In uh, the AL uh, Music Cats by JNLA, she starts out by sharing a very personal story on why this park, music, the serenity of the park, and a cat are so important to her. And she also shares that this is the puzzle adventure lab. And to solve the puzzle, you'll need to use your memory or the internet. And you can also watch a YouTube uh, video as a workaround for this. Okay, the first location is, it's sure it's quiet in here. It's a story that has a backstory. The story is it's two musicians who got together, created an album. The album was not a success, so they went their separate ways. But somebody took one of the songs off the album and overdubbed it, added some music, added some electric instruments, and so forth. Uh, she shares that the first location, the inspiration for the opening line of this song came from one of the artist's childhood where he sang in the bathroom with the lights out. Uh, there's the backstory. So, based on what you know, without access to the internet, does anybody know what the song is? And the first, the original song, had plural word and the release, second release song had a single singular word. Anybody know what it is? No? <laughs> so, yeah, kind of interesting. And you may never look at that uh, line, Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. Okay, I started this presentation with a clip from R. Reagan's Finding an Enemy AL. The AL starts at the post coordinates of the bonus cache, where you gather information on doing the Adventure Lab, also play a video clip. And here's a short version of the clip in, just case, in case you missed it. All right. You will see an enemy soon. So. A little bit of work went into this. <laughs> okay. Went to do it the other day, actually had a little bit of difficulty with it, but I thought it was very, very creative. <clears throat> um, it's sequential because you do have to find all uh, locations and it kind of follows the little story. Um, and if you read the description, you'll know what you need to do. Okay, we're going to start off with the wooded way. By reading the instructions, we're going to see that you need to go to a web page to watch a video and get instructions on what to do um, and instructions on what to do if you cannot win. Win what? Win a game of hangman. And all the words are different, but they all are related to uh, geocaching. Okay, the next location is uh, Lucius Cincinnatus. I can't pronounce the middle word name. He's a Roman hero here. He was uh, honorably portrayed as a pig in Cincinnati art exhibit because the city is named after him. You must touch your language skills. When you watch the video, you learn, you're going to learn the word that you need for the answer. Emperor Ye in Senatus K. Iwe Xpeg Peyton Lay. In Ye Ig Peyton Lay, Ethe answer Ye or Ways Ye O Mons Ray. Umprehend K. That's 
Yeah. Got anybody here who was a the junior high in about 1960 something? Who could what language was it? Big Latin. Big Latin, of course, of course. Anybody know what the word was? Could they recognize it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's it. You know, you may leave here with some examples and perhaps some ideas, some inspiration on how to use that uh, unused uh, Adventure Lab credit that you have. Uh, you may work on just something simple like improving the description and the locations. Or you might be able to take this and go a little bit further and make something equivalent of a gadget cache or a clever cache. You may be that person, or maybe not. But at least you're going to live he leave here with the knowledge that some people will be creating the adventure labs that are beyond five quick finds. And hopefully you'll accept the challenge to change your expectations of adventure labs just a little bit. And you'll read the description. Um, including this one that's out here today called uh, Leveling Up Your Adventure Lab. What you use is examples that I used here. We have code words, has nothing to do with locations, has a little puzzle built into it, um, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, the QR code is on your paper if you just want to scan it. And that's it. <laughs>